Alrighty. Today, ladies and gentlemen, from that little intro, if you're <laughs> listening to the podcast, um, is the Brass Dragon. Yeah, after that intro, I definitely want to DM a dr- Brass Dragon. Oh my god, it's I, I DM'd <laughs> one. I wasn't like that, but like they are fun <laughs> just to annoy everyone. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes, yeah, so this episode is on the infamously fun and annoying Brass Dragon. Our first metallic dragon. True. Yes. So let's get right into the basics. So the basics, when you first come across a brass dragon, um, if you even see it in its true form, the brass dragon is the smallest of the metallic dragons, the true metallic dragons. Yes. But how? But metallic dragons are very tricky to figure out what they look like. They all look very similar besides the silver dragon. But the brass dragon, you can tell... By its, um, on its head, it has a broad, protective brass plate on its head. Yes. Kind of like a crest. And not horns. Yeah, not horns. They're it, plates. Yeah, imagine kind of like a, like a triceratops frill, just not as crazy. But, but without but, horns. Yeah, without <laughs> horns, yes. Yeah. But yeah, so it kind of has like this frill brass plating. Um, it has a spiky beard, which um, other dragons have. Um, it has a spine that goes from the base of its head. Uh, of down its neck down to its body and it stops kind of like where its hips are and um if you and its wings are very unique of dragons not for metallics but for most dragons most people think of them as bat wings for normal dragons but uh this brass dragon has like a man ray type yeah. of wing it, it starts kind of like it's like just sticks out and then gets smaller and smaller it's and a it runs wing that all the way down to the tail yeah it runs all the way down as opposed to kind of being cut off and separate from the body mm-hmm. it's kind of like uh having attached earlobes versus unattached right. they have attached wings there's not that parting of the earlobe yeah yeah, yeah. And um, their wings on the edges of them will have a tint of a light green, kind of like the Statue of Liberty green. Over mm. time, brass will turn green because it's like the rust. So the older the dragon, the more green its wings will be at the edges. And um, when you look into the dragon's eyes, you can see pupils in the younger dragons, but as they age, their entire eye becomes like a meta- molted metallic orb. Mm. And that's kind of like what its eye looks like. It's just flowing metal. Cool. Liquid metal. Yeah, so pretty unique. Pretty cool nice. looking dragon. Yes, in general, they are one of the weakest, if not the weakest, dragon type. Um, however, that does not mean they're the least fun, of course. Uh, they, they're quite the party. Um, but in terms of the basics of their personality, they're just extremely sociable and extroverted. Mm-hmm. We'll get more into it, but... They like to talk. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's their that's kind of their claim to fame is their personality. Um, okay. Do you want to get into stats? Yeah, so I can begin with stats. So, remember, a so we're just going to talk about the adult dragon stats as that's probably the, the type that you will use. So, a adult dragon is a CR 13, and um, they have an AC of 18, <laughs> um... Hit points at average of 172. It can move 40 feet, but unique to brass dragons, they can burrow 30 feet and fly with 80. Um, and to interject, I don't know if you just said this, but we're talking about the adult. You said that? Oh, you said that. Okay, sorry. I uh, was thinking about something. Um, okay, yes, and I'll go right into their stats since I'm already talking. Um, they have a strength of plus 6, a dex of plus 0, a con of plus five intelligence of plus two a wisdom of plus one and a charisma of plus three so notable things here is they're pretty good at everything um but their charisma is plus three which is kind of very much linked to who they are um but all around they got those basic dragon traits where they're Mm -hmm. pretty good but they could be better um if they were a different type of dragon well remember this is the weakest of the true dragons Yes, um, exactly. So, but still, they're not a pushover, though. And just to say, for all of their stats, the older they are, the stronger they'll be, and the younger, the weaker. So, yes, yeah. So we're so. talking about adult dragons, but if they become ancient, then we're sitting at in the twenties yes. um, of a CR. So they can definitely get very powerful. Okay, so along with their basic stats, they have some skills, and so they get a plus seven to history, 
which we will talk about why, a plus 11 to perception, a plus 8 to persuasion, and a plus 5 to stealth. So there's definitely some stuff there that's very relevant to their personality. They are immune to fire damage because they breathe it. Spoilers. Um, and their senses are blind sight up, up to 60 feet, dark vision up to 120 feet, and they have a passive perception of 21, and their languages are common and draconic, of course. However, they will likely speak more languages, and we'll get into that later. Yeah, so they, yeah. So um, now I can t uh, go into their abilities. So they have legendary resistance three times a day, which is basically, it's really broken, and basically if a dragon fails a save, it can say, no, no, I'll just succeed it. And yeah. it'll just succeed when it I wants to. I don't consider to. it broken. I mean, it, 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 if it's a character strong. had it, it'd be broken. But I think dragons they need, need to be resistant to someone just snapping their fingers and doing something crazy. Yeah. Like, the dragon should pose a threat, because it's a dragon. So they're exactly. in the name Dungeons & Dragons. So. Exactly. Yeah. It should have legendary resistance. Yeah, so... Ba Basically, that's what legend legendary resistance um, does, but they do have a multi-attack, pretty good one. Uh, firstly, they can use frightful presence, just in the beginning of their turn, which frightens creatures, basically. Of course, yeah, we'll get into fr uh, frightful presence. All dragons have it, and then they can do one bite and two claws, so three attacks in the multi-attack. But there is more. But let's just get into the base stats of uh, the bite and the claws. It's bite gets um, a plus 11 to hit, so a lot, basically. Um, it's a 10-foot reach, and normally it does around 17 damage or 2d10s plus 6 piercing damage. And if you want to add more, I believe it does fire damage, but only I, chromatics do that? No, it's bite doesn't. Oh, it's bite. So it I, must, yeah, must I, be your only chromatic trait. Yeah, it's chromatic just simple bite. melee attacks are actually pretty basic compared yeah. to other dragons. Yeah, yeah. so... Yeah, um, now we'll get into its claws. It also has a plus 11 to hit. It has a 5-foot reach, and it does base around 13 or 2d6 plus 6 slashing damage. So pretty good just base damage overall. Um, they do have a tail attack, which they get a plus 11 to hit, a 15-foot range, and it does generally uh, 15 damage to 2d8 plus 6 bludgeoning damage but the tail attack is not included in the multi-attack multi -attack. and you're probably wondering like then why did they put that in we'll explain why though they also have frightful presence which basically it can choose a creature that is within 120 feet away from it and the creature must succeed a dc wisdom saving throw or be frightened of the dragon for one minute and so basically when you're frightened to something, that means you can't go near it willingly. If you're near it and if you try to attack it, you're at disadvantage. And you're just trying, you're, so you're just really scared of the dragon. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, if you do fail, you're scared of it. But every, in the beginning of your turn, you can re-roll that check to try to succeed and resist the fear. And once you do resist the fear, you're immune to the frightful presence for 24 hours. So yep. pretty good stuff. True. What is unique to um, metallic dragons is they have two breath weapons, a lethal and a non-lethal. And firstly, we'll just discuss the lethal because it's simple. But they have two because um, they are good dragons. Yeah, and so good. having a non-lethal form of defense is, you know, very intric in integral. integral. It's very much part of who they are, right? If you're good and you don't want to hurt things, but you still need to defend yourself... Having a non-lethal form of doing so is exactly what they want. So they have one. Yes, so it is really nice. We'll be talking about the not uh, the lethal one, which um, they'll use at last resort, unless they're killing something evil. But, um, yeah, we'll get into that. It is a fire breath, but it's a unique fire breath because it's not a cone, it's a line. So it kind of like spits fire, like literally, you know, like water. Like when you spit water, you shoot like that line. Yeah. It's not but fire, so like a flamethrower. Um, it shoots a 60-foot line of fire. That is five feet wide, so it'll hit, it'll hit everything in the line. And if it does um, go in your path, you have to make a DC 18 deck saving throw or take 45 average damage, or you can roll 13 D8s. D6s, I think. D6s. Um, Sorry. Yeah, and it's a 60-foot line, I am hypothesizing, because 
of actually the original lore, and it didn't always have fire breath. It actually used to have, or was intended to have, more of a like uh, gaseous spray or like a, a steaming boiling water type spray, um, which seems to be more of like it would be in a line, kind of like the black dragon with acid. I kind of think of it as kind of like, um, have you seen the movie How to Train Your Dragon? Yes. I kind of think of it as kind of like the zipple back. Yeah, it doesn't uh, spread out, but I feel like it shoots a gas at a target and it just lights it. And it just, sh- you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but that would be like a that I mean, would that, that wouldn't be a line. I mean, that'd I, be the opposite of a line. Yeah, I, I know that's kind of not a line, but I imagine it shoots out like a gas first and then it lights it with them. Um, it's uh, it's a line. Yeah, I don't actually very much like this fire breath the way it's kind of done because yeah, um, it's not really that. It's not strong. Like what it really is kind of the theme is is a liquid. And so maybe it would like shoot a liquid and then light the liquid. Um, but it lives in the desert, which we'll get into, which makes no – any creature that lives in the desert would never shoot out its own liquid. Or otherwise it would Well, it actually can. It can, but it never would is what I'm saying. Well, it, it's, a ba- it's like a bad combo. Well, it does have like a spell, which it can just create. That's true. Magic solves all our problems. Yeah, so magic um, solves okay, all I'll get into the other breath weapon. So the other breath weapon, um, which is under the same recharge it's, as the fire breath. So, so if you pick, if you do one, you can't do the other until it recharges. Um, and that is sleep breath. Every metallic dragon has a different non-lethal breath, and this one has sleep breath, and it seems to be a very good one. And so what sleep breath does is it does a sixty-foot cone of something it's not exactly specified it's gas yeah it's some sort of gas that puts you to sleep and if you are in the gas in the 60 foot cone you have to make a dc 18 constitution save or you fall unconscious for 10 minutes and if a creature takes damage or is woken up uh they'll become conscious again but it's a very strong power because it doesn't matter how many hit points you have if you get hit by it and fail to save bam you're on you're asleep you're going to bed Yep. Yep. Um, that's a great way for the dragon to neutralize you if you are um, someone that they don't want to hurt. Okay. Um, one more thing is this is all the adult uh, dragon stat, as we've said, but they do actually add an ability when they become ancient. So I think we should mention it. And that ability is change shape. And this is basically polymorph. So they can. Um, they can switch. They can change their shape into any creature or humanoid uh, with a CR that is no higher than their own. I'm pretty sure it's beasts, though. It's like beasts and humanoids. I don't think they can turn into like a griffin or something. Maybe not. I don't know. I I thought it said creature, but who knows? I actually wasn't reading it that closely. But I know they can at least be humanoids, which is what they use it for the most. Um, yeah. So you'll m- most of the time you won't see a brass dragon. You'll see them as a humanoid in society or a bird watching you. So. They could be with you this whole time. You would never know. True. Um, okay, one more thing for their stats. And so no matter whether they're adult or ancient, but nothing else, they have legendary actions. They're legendary. Yes, and these are the re- these are the normal legendary actions for dragons. They have the ability to detect, which means they get to make a perception check. They have a tail attack, which means they get to make a tail attack. And they have a wing attack, which costs two actions out of the three that they have per round. And a wing attack allows them to basically beat their wings and create, like, wind and fly up in the air uh, up to half their flying speed, which is 40. That's good. And anyone within 10 feet of them doing this has to make a DC 19 deck save or take 13 on average or 2d6 plus 6 uh bludgeoning i'm not sure bludgeoning damage uh and get knocked prone so basically they get knocked down through wind and i guess hit their head on the ground or something um (laughs) yeah and that's a good way for the dragon to get out of you know if they're overwhelmed um but that's getting into combat strategies let's move on to personality so the personality of brass dragons this is big this is big they are the most talkative and social of all of the dragons. Yes, the Monster Manual describes them as gregarious. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> they will talk and talk and talk to literally anything. 
That yeah. is sentient. Yeah, they yes. they not like we can say that they love to talk to other creatures, but it's which is true. But it, it's it, it's more of an urge, like a like like literally they cannot help but want super badly to talk with other things, um, and so this can actually manifest itself uh, to the extreme. So instead of it being like, oh man, that's a really nice dragon, it can be like, wow, this dragon is way too overbearing or like way too much, basically. Yeah. They can get so overwhelmed by this personality trait of theirs, of being of their desire to talk, that they will even force these conversations onto other creatures. And yeah, so basically they will non consensually pluck people and make them talk to them. Yeah. yeah, so like so. the classic example of the brass dragon is them putting you to sleep and then you waking up in their lair uh, neck deep in sand with just your head sticking out of the ground and so them funny. sitting there and being like, so. Uh, How's your day going, buddy? <laughs> just like, what? <laughs> yeah, um, which obviously sounds kind of evil, but they really mean no harm, but they just really, really, really want to talk really to you. Really want to talk to you. And actually... In a second, in the personality section, I will get into kind of a little bit of a negative twist on why they do these things. Um, but let's just name off some other things that they are. Um, they are pretty friendly. Mm-hmm. Generally, they don't, you know, they don't mean any harm. They don't want to. But some can, like, could be like a child, you know, when you have a magnifying glass with ants. They can be kind of cruel. May I mean, I wouldn't. I it, don't think so. It's rare, but like I read that, I was like, "Huh, interesting." It was in Fizz Band, so I thought it was pretty cool. But, oh, okay. Yeah, it was showing like examples like some can be evil because they like cruelty. They're like a child, so I see. Know. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I mean, they don't like want to hurt you. Yes, all kids are evil, even if they're metallic. I guess. I just mean in life. Yeah, kids. Uh, I mean, kids, kids literally don't have the developmental like they have not developed to the point of being a moral human yet. Exactly. Think of that <laughs> for like a brass dragon. Like some brass dragons, even when they're adults, like think kind of like kids, sort of ish. Okay. They are like, okay. So like, like they're kind of intelligent, but sometimes they're kind of clueless of what they're doing, and they're just really excited. Yeah. And stuff like that. But sometimes they can be accidentally cruel, and you know, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a couple. But that's rare. Things that are related. So you mentioned they're friendly. Um, they are definitely friendly, and they can actually be nice and helpful to the point of being very nice and helpful uh to world they will go out of their way to help people um and not i mean if you ask them for aid they will almost definitely give it and talk to you while they do it unless you're like give me money and they're like maybe. yes that's true they it's won't. a maybe it's a maybe it's a maybe <laughs> um but they might actually be seeking someone to help like they are like just genuinely like man i wonder if i can help someone today you know what i mean um i so wish we were that. all like that we wake up Man, I just want to help someone today. You know, just help them get through the day. And then get up and fly away. Yes. Um, And with this desire for uh, conversation and also this desire to um, help people, they are also one of the most naive dragons. And so they'll basically trust anyone who gives them a good conversation. However, uh, you had mentioned if you ask them for money or something – they are also dragons, which means they are hyper intelligent. They want money. Um, well, no, that doesn't. Yes, well, actually, not quite. Um, the, all dragons want to hoard, but what they hoard is different. Uh, but these dragons are hyper intelligent because they're dragons, and so if you try to manipulate them, they will know. They will know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> like they want to talk to you, but they are not stupid. So, like, if you try to manipulate them, they'll realize it probably i mean obviously if you're like a master manipulator maybe not but they'll probably realize it and then they'll they'll respond with their own manipulation (laughs) and they can be quite manipulative baby (laughs) yeah they're very charismatic and you know they they're made to manipulate if they need to that's kind of like their dark side so don't try to manipulate them that's not really a dark side though i mean that's your fault you know but it's it's a it's a power they have that is negative manipulation Uh so although they have it you know, it's kind of, like, not something they would use typically. I don't think it's as good as, like, green dragons, but that's what they're all about. No, it's not. It's, they're just very intelligent, so you try to manipulate them, you're gonna be, 
you're going to be fighting something that is also very intelligent. So, like, you're not going to easily trick them. They, they can trick you as easy as you can trick them, right? So you're, you're playing with just a smart being, not an expert manipulator, just a very smart being. And all smart mm-hmm. beings, especially brass dragons, are good at manipulation. Um, but they're naive otherwise. So if you're not trying to manipulate them, you know, you're they're not going to be, like, figuring you out. Like, if you're evil but you haven't done anything evil, they, they, they don't care. Yeah, you know I mean, they're, or they might not even know. You know what I mean? So they're not trying to figure that out. Okay, so that's kind of their good stuff. Um, I guess actually, there's one more good thing. Just the fact that they're metallic is they are peaceful, right? They are never trying to get into a fight. They actually are so anti-fighting, anti-combat that other dragons will consider them cowards. Oh, blue. Ooh. Yeah, you know, we'll get into enemies and allies, yeah. Yeah, so they're very peaceful. So the good things about them is they're peaceful, they're very social, they're very nice and helpful, um, but and intelligent, but they're naive. And then there's also two more sinister personality traits. They're cowardly a bit. Well, there's cowardly, yes. Um, but we have to remember that that dragons and including brass dragons are individuals so there are some negative things that influence their personality um to a more or less degree depending on the individual and these are as follows they're selfish well all of them are yeah yes but while they also will they they will give a lot of themselves right they will uh go out and help people you know maybe if there's a sandstorm they'll 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 harbor them They'll display their layers to people for enjoyment, stuff like this. They're very selfless, but it's but they can be very selfish in the process of being selfless, if this makes sense. And so basically, while they're they're very willing to help and stuff, what they really desire is conversation. And sometimes this conversation is very self centered and not really suited for the other person's enjoyment. So they might just be monologuing about their trip to wherever, and the other creatures might be like the so bored, and <laughs> the brass dragon doesn't necessarily care, but also may not even be aware of that fact. Um, so insight might not be their best thing sometimes, and so they can be selfish in this regard, where they're just they're just not making this conversation an equal one, right, um, or interesting or valuable. They're just doing it to have a conversation, period. Okay. The other negative thing about them, which has to do with being a dragon in general, is that they are egotistical. Um, but this manifests itself in, in, in the reasoning behind why they're so social and why they might kidnap someone to talk to them. And so the reason they might, kids, might kidnap someone to talk to them is because of their ego. They believe that they are such good conversationalists and so worthy of talking to that it would be a shame for any creature not to get the privilege so funny and so if a creature doesn't want to they'll literally be like oh that that doesn't make sense like of course you want to if you don't want to i'm gonna force you because it's 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 for your own good you want to talk to me it's good for you to talk to me you see you (laughs) might learn a couple of things yeah and so they're gonna bury you in the sand and force you to talk to them for your own good (laughs) Um, but that's that egotistical uh personality trait in that they think they're the best right all dragons have it and so in this regard they think they're so good that anyone should be talking to them and if they don't want to it's they're mistaken and they actually should um, and that's that's their personality. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no. That pretty sums up. It's pretty funny. Yeah, there's that, a lot of traits here. There's peaceful, social, helpful, nice, intelligent, naive, selfish, egotistical, curious. They can be curious. Too. Curious, right? They're wanting to learn information, and all of these things can be mixed and matched to to more or less degrees to create an individual, which is a dragon. Um, and so they have, they have a very complex personality, but these are kind of the core traits of them. You're not going to find one that's, like, literally evil. You're not going to find one that's shy. Like, that doesn't happen with brass dragons. But they can still be very different by, you know, switching up how much you're focusing on these traits, right? So if one is, like, really intelligent, that would make a very different... Uh, encounter than one that's less intelligent and more naive stuff like that but they're all going to be those type of things okay all right motivations 
Yeah, so um, basically they are very self-determined of themselves to go seek out and find new ways, to, new people, new races to talk to. Yes. Anything that is sentient. Weapons, animals, people, anything. They want to talk to it. They want to learn things from them, learn new things, you know? Yep. They're kind of like, God, it's like children candy, but instead of candy, it's like talking. They want to talk to people. Yeah, they I don't know what it would be a good everyone. analogy. Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. But um, they also want to grab things for their hordes as well, which are, you know, we'll talk about them in hordes, but they also want to get stuff for their hordes. So they'll go seek out, find treasure, and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, so basically it's pretty simple. Their motivations is um, want to talk to stuff. They want to find stuff, find communication. Yeah. And find... the motivation underlying what why they want to talk to things is that I mean, it's really just knowledge. They want to learn about other creatures and their lives just because they enjoy learning. Also, they probably have a kind of an insecurity type personality where they desire company and they aren't very comfortable by themselves. Like they very much need that connection. And I mean, you can see this with humans. Like some humans just really need to be to some degree in contact with another human and all humans are social creatures but you can see a big difference between one human and another right some humans like a writer or something can sit in the room all day and be by themselves while other people would literally die if they had to do that um and so if if you see a difference in the same species this is you know the brass dragons are the species of dragon that have the genes or traits that make them need company and so it's just like a, a primitive, like, they need that connection. And so that's their underlying motivation is just having company. Yeah. Um, and so one more motivation, which is unrelated, is they want to keep their desert home, which we'll get more into, you know, their layers. But they want to keep their home, which is the desert, in balance. And so they understand how fragile a desert is because there's so few creatures um, you know, it's a very harsh environment. So a giant, you know, apex predator is not necessarily supported by this by this very uh, fragile ecosystem that is the desert. So they want to keep it in in balance. And so what that leads them to do a lot of times is actually starve themselves so that they don't mess up the environment. Now they're not going to let, let themselves die, but they'll go like a long time without food or drink. Um, and they've actually, throughout generations, have uh, gotten the ability to live off of very little uh, resources, very little nourishment. Yeah, can't they just eat, like, one cat? Oh, no, they, they eat, like, the cactus, like, not pus, but, like, nectar. Maybe, but... Like, they're... a cactus every morning will produce, like, this type of water, and the brass dragon will go down and just lick it all up and... Well, what you're talking... No, so the lore talks about morning dew. Yeah, and morning, morning dew is, is yeah. just um, water from the air uh, condensing onto a plant um, because there's moisture in the air. And so what they'll do is they'll just go over and lick it off. And a lot of bugs in real life will live off of morning dew that accumulates, like, on their eyes... Ew. And so they'll just lick it off themselves, and then they'll be good for the day. But dragons are obviously huge. Brass dragons are very big, a lot bigger than bugs. So the fact that they can they can just lick all these plants and get the nourishment they need is pretty uh, pretty crazy, um, and a very powerful ability or helpful ability, I guess, that they have. However, this lack of nourishment might also be linked to their small stature. Um, so those all kind of fit together pretty well. Interesting. But yeah, they have a strong desire of keeping their ecosystem safe to the point that they will go without nourishment. That is really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. So are we going to go to social structure now? I think we will. So this is kind of a big one. You might think, wait, what would happen if two brasses, brass dragons talk to each other? The conversation of a lifetime. Well, here's <laughs> the thing. They don't actually really like it that much because yeah. they'll talk and they'll talk and they'll talk to the point where one of them will offend the other of what they said. I think this is so funny. This is one reason. Yeah. There's one actually, reason, yeah. yeah. So they'll just leave, right? 
And then once they leave, the other one will prank, will offend the other one by pranking them, by like, I don't know, doing something. So then we'll spawn a rivalry of brass dragons. They're not like a harmful ri- rivalry, but they'll just prank each other for decades. Yeah, I, what you're describing reminds me of like having a roommate and just like, you might really like your roommate and this, they might be your friend, but after after so much time of being in close proximity with them, it they get on your nerves. And that's kind of what you're describing. Another reason is that, like I said, they can be very selfish in a conversation and you can't have two selfish people in the conversation. Like if one person is really talkative and the other person is really talkative, then Uh-oh. they're just going to both be trying to like get their words in. Like yeah, one's talking, one's talking, one's talking, and it just doesn't work. If you the the best person to be with a brass dragon is a really good listener, <laughs> yes. because brass dragons just don't stop talking. Yeah. Um, so having two people like that is a problem, and so that's why brass dragons actually the the least favorite creature to talk to for a brass dragon is another brass dragon. But there is a good side; they can fall in love. They can. They can. And overcome this. Yeah, and overcome this. And um, they will be very good parents to the children. If they have kids. Will probably have kids. Yeah. So their society basically is... They keep their distance, but they keep like a loose connection. Because they're very social, so they still are like, Oh, hey, how are you? Doing good. You know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, all right, great. And then they go away. Yeah. (laughs) And then they go on their separate ways, you know? Yeah, it's like having a friend from like... A less like an old school like friend like maybe if you're in high school now you know a friend from middle school or if you're in college now a friend from high school or vice you know keeps going and that's kind of how they keep it you know kind of distanced um but when they do come together it's to mate and the reason they actually work pretty well is because they will not allow their eggs to go unprotected but the problem with that is they really need company and so what they do is they just stay together. The the mommy brass dragon and the daddy brass dragon stay at each other's side so that they both have company while they protect the eggs. Um, so, so sweet. So it, it's kind of a sweet relationship. There. But that means for like a couple months they're just like, and do you remember, honey, this story? Wait, wait, wait dear, hold on one second. Do you remember that one time? They just keep <laughs> interrupting each other. Just like every like thing in the horse, just like yeah. I'm very. I'm picturing a very dysfunctional oh, family. Yeah, family. But but a family. It's kind of like the couple that really likes each other, but will not stop arguing. I, that's what I picture. Like they're in the kitchen, just like I'm done with this, and this, you know what I mean. They're just driving themselves crazy. But maybe they get along. Maybe they can have a little self awareness and listen for a change when they mate. But. But that, that's a fun little social yeah, no, structure there. Yeah, that's fun. That's yeah. Fun. All right, so do you want to move to enemies and allies? Absolutely. So basically, the main rival, besides themselves, talkatively, um, to a brass dragon, papers are like messed up, is a blue dragon. They both share the same habitat, and blues in combat will smack, utterly destroy a brass dragon. Yeah. So this is why a it's lot of a other dragons... Call brass dragons cowards because blue dragons are kind of like the battle masters of dragon kind, strategic, they love battle and stuff like that. And it annoys the actual, like, just the living hell out of them. That the brass dragon, once he sees the blue dragon, the blue dragon's like, oh, he's just gonna run. And he does, he just runs, (laughs) he'll just hide. Because blue dragons like to fight in the air. They're the best flyers of all dragon kind, and they'll just stay in the air and just snipe with lightning bolts. Brass dragons do like the opposite. They'll hang low and they'll just dart from cave. They'll, they'll dart from mound to mound. It just annoys them. They're like, "Holy Jesus! Just stand still and fight me!" But then the brass dragon's like, "No!" And he burrows away and leaves. Yeah. So so, <laughs> so really, yeah. Let's yeah. talk about this relationship. Blue dragons, brass dragons. This is like the big brass dragons are really friendly, right? Blue dragons are bullies to them. Like, this is a bully relationship. Brass dragons have no chance of defeating one, with a small exception. I'll get into in a second. But, yeah, they run away, and it annoys the blue dragons. But the brass dragons are nice. They're not trying to do anything except live with these uh, with other creatures of the desert. So it's really the blue dragon who's the jerk here. Yeah. You know what no. I mean? And so the blue dragon is really trying to just hunt the brass dragon. And the brass dragon 
being a dragon is still capable of escaping. Oh, but he um, could like polymorph into a beetle and just burrow. Yes, <laughs> and then um, he's just gone. I mean, the big thing a, a brass dragon has is burrow. Yeah, um, which is helpful against a blue dragon. Um, but but this is really an imbalance of power. A blue dragon if given even the smallest like window of opportunity could kill a brass dragon pretty, real quick yeah so oh no they are like twice the size yeah like a blue dragon's huge and they are like expert battles the only yeah. dragons that will even like stand a chance against a blue dragon is just a physical red that is bigger and obviously a gold the gold would be like oh you think a oh, magic spell you're Kapoof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know all uh, that. But so like, blues are are one of the strongest, and, second strongest, and they're a dragon. Tree. Yeah. So. Yeah. So they're like fourth or like third. So it really depends. So the best chance a brass has of surviving the arrival of a blue dragon is to immediately get out of there. Yeah, get the hell um, out of there. Bro. However, this is an especially fun like idea, and brass dragons we cannot forget are extremely sociable. And so let me get into kind of their like the blue dragon is their enemy but besides blue dragons and i guess like evil creatures in general they have a ton of friends they're friends to everyone guys. Na- yeah name anyone that is not completely evil and they're friends with it um so when a blue dragon does show up it the brass dragon although physically completely incapable of facing it does have a giant network of friends that the brass dragon could if it wanted to uh probably use to to deal with the blue dragon indirectly this is actually kind of the the relationship of chromatics and metallics generally except for reds and golds that's completely different but like silvers and reds coppers reds reds are really the ones that deal with them but blues and brasses brass dragons will rely on their friends Mm-hmm. as all metallics do chromatics are a lot more common than metallics metallics are rare very rare there are 10 chromatics to a metallic right that's kind of like the how you should vi- visualize it so in one desert there should be 10 blues one brass mm. so he is outnumbered yes Heavily. however however we're not just talking dragons this is like if if this could be like portal scene of Endgame, right? Literally like Thanos, like the dragon. sphinxes start showing up, genies start throwing stuff. The adventurers might join this fight. Oh yeah, baby. like this is gonna be this is gonna be where Thanos walks up and then the homies and then cool. Avengers assemble. Yeah, you know so what I mean? it's time yeah, to go. Yeah, so brasses are the best at this, but the, well, giants uh, at giants. Well, giants maybe. Giants don't like dragons generally, but good giants. That's maybe true. a storm giant be like, hey. Oh, buddy, yeah, it'd be like, a storm giant. Yeah, the hell but that's I... a very good ally. Yeah, that is. Well, yeah. they're both electricity, so I don't know. But, um, yeah, but um, brass dragons are the best at this, only rivaled by silvers for getting help. When they need help, they're like, guys. They'll, they'll like, polymorph into a person and go to a tavern. It's like, adventurers, look, 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 look. I heard there's a blue dragon out there. This is causing chaos, right? He got all the good crap, though, in his horde. Go mess him up, boys. You yeah, know, so the, but so he the, also has lasting relationship. The brass dragon or she has lasting relationships with all these creatures. Yeah, and so, so sphinxes will mess up. Well, he yeah, sphinxes yeah. will mess up exactly. <laughs> dragons. Yeah. So it's like even so, like obviously there's sphinxes, and that's actually a big ally of, oh, of brass dragons. So they're good there. But even like if it's like just a a city of like sand gnomes or something, like the sand gnome, it's like. This dragon has helped us for for hundreds of years. Like, let's help him out, boys. Let's band together and get rid of I the just, blue dragon. I, I just imagine an adventure walks up, is like, what the heck is that? All you see is just gnomes on like car, like ve- like desert vehicles with like harpoon, like bull. Repeating ballistas and yeah. stuff like that, just pulling up to a blue dragon. It's like, hey, you mess with the wrong guy, dude. Exactly. No, I mean it's the classic story. Like we just watched a wonderful life where the main character is super selfless, constantly like sacrificing his own like financial status and stuff for the for the city. And then at the end, he goes uh, uh, there's a mishap and he's about to get arrested for like fraud, but he didn't do anything wrong. And the whole town bands together and raises the money and gets it. Done. Like and this is what I'm up. picturing for like exactly. brass dragon. Like exactly. Like the brass dragon has been so selfless and nice for so long that when he is down, everyone is everyone realizes it's like oh wow 
someone that has been such a good friend to us is going to get hurt. Like, it doesn't matter what our differences is. The whole desert is about to band together and help this but, brass dragon. But drop on this blue dragon, you know? Yeah. Honestly, that would be such a good campaign. It's like this brass dragon's been helping you out for so long. And then the end battle is, up, is the brass dragon, like, on its last legs against the blue. And the blue's just beating him up <laughs> until the adventurer's comes, like, nut to dick. <laughs> just, like, coming in, you know, sphinx might yeah. pull up. Yeah. And if your adventurers are evil enough to harm a brass dragon... Just give them the desert as their next enemy. Yes. The <laughs> desert itself. Yes. Uh, yes. Anyway. So, yes. Lots. Too many allies to even name. But obviously it's going to be desert things because that's just where they live, which we're about to get into. Um, but, yeah. Their arch enemy is the blue dragon because blue dragons come into the desert and they kill blast dragons just on site, basically. Well, yeah. So yeah, It's kind of sad. Yeah. But they're evil. Blue dragons are evil. Um. And unfortunately, they are pretty strategic. So they're hard. No, they are very strategic. They're hard to deal with. Like, Actually, even if you have annoying. a bunch of friends, the blue dragon will probably know this and be able to plan ahead. He'll, he'll just camp in the sky and just shoot lightning. That, that's basically all they do. So It really is a it's Thanos really Avengers situation. It is Thanos. Because Thanos is really strong. But if you band together, maybe you can do it. Maybe you can beat him. Yeah. 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 But obviously Actually, we... <laughs> Blue Dragons also have that chin, too. They have, like, a very distinct chin. Not like a yeah, Thanos we'll do chin. another episode on Blue Dragons. Yeah. They're cool. Yeah. No, um, they let's not cool. steal the Brass Dragons' thunder here. All right, but now let's get into the Brass Dragons' lair, which yeah. I have a very good thing for. Welcome to d and Ikea. That's basically <laughs> what Brass Dragons like. Well, bef- well, before we get into what's in their lair, let's just talk about, like, where the lair is. Right. So, as we've said, it's in the desert. Love Sunny hot yeah basically that they, not yeah. only do they kind of camouflage in the desert but they are just really like heat so the the reason the this heat liking uh, affects what they choose so they'll normally pick ruins or canyons or caves or whatever natural stuff is sitting in a desert which isn't a ton but they can burrow so underground is open to them um but they do like the sun uh which is one of the reasons they're in the desert so they'll typically have holes or like big windows in their layers to let the sunlight in. Um, also, they will always have in their lair an art gallery mm-hmm. and a place for conversation called the Grand Conversation Hall. So it, it's, it actually has its own name because of how common it is in a brass dragon's lair. Um, and the both these rooms and the layers in general are designed by the brass dragon to be very attractive and comfortable to other humanoids or creatures as an incentive for those creatures to come and visit them and talk. Um, so do you want to get into basically their treasures? So you mentioned furniture. That is yeah, so, one of them. Yeah, so basically they are Ikea of the D&D world. So you will see all sorts of the rare, very nice furniture, couches, chairs, um, you know, fireplaces fireplace but you know just general furniture for the when they shape shift into human form and talk to humanoids um they also love art galleries as we said again so they'll have pieces of art or mental weapons um paintings but what makes a brass dragon tick when it comes to their horde what they love the most is sentient objects so sentient weapons sentient paintings kind of like the paintings in, in harry potter right he would have those yeah and also like genies in the um genie lamps yeah genie lamps you can just rub it yeah. and you get a free conversation yeah, free conversation they're like, yeah. they're like all right what are your three wishes oh uh, i just uh, wanted to what, talk what to do you, you think about what do you think i should choose it's just like they're like i don't i don't know <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> funny <laughs> like we literally had this conversation like six times <laughs> I just please. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There's so. actually a short story by Neil Gaiman, which is a genie that comes out for this woman. And All the, she does is just talk to it. He's just well, like, so the genie's like, what do you want? And the woman's like, nothing. I'm like, I don't think there's anything I want. And he's like, well, the genie's like, well, come on. There's there's definitely something you want. Like, like what about this? And she's like, no. I, like, I'm pretty happy with my life. And it's a cool little short story about life and kind of like the d- desires. And then in the end, the genie ends up just never going back in the lamp and they like get married. It's interesting. Wait, what? Yeah, like the genie is like, huh, 
Like you've given me a new outlook, and they just never he never goes but back. But one that was just like I wish you'd be free, so you can like do your. But yeah, imagine like carrying like that lamp around, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah, I don't remember exactly. It's a cool short story. Uh, yeah, pretty cool. Anyway, yeah. So a lot of conscious things will be in this lair. Maybe some anim- desert animals might be in there. Some people. Some of, you might walk into a lair, and, and the brass dragon's just talking to like some other people. They're like, "Oh, guys, look." More people, <laughs> you know, and they kind of like look around. They're like, "Oh, come, come sit by, sit, sit at my nice gold plated table, and you know, we'll talk yeah. about some stuff." Yeah. So yeah, you so. you mentioned basically all the things they have, and all of them are around one single theme, and that is everything that's conversation related. So obviously, furniture is like strictly not only to be admired, but also like literally a place to sit while you talk. Um paintings and other art uh is all about the story and like the interpretation of them so Mm -hmm. they're conversation starters right so if the brass dragon is like oh yes i got this painting back in blah 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 or it's an interpretation on blah 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 it's stuff to talk about and so that's what they love stuff to talk about and this is this this could be books too it's like oh have you read this book me too like let's talk about it book club um, so any sort of things that just have a cool backstory or an otherwise sense of wonder, like a really nice painting or maybe like a magic carpet or magic mirror, where it's just – it's something to talk about, right? Like that's what they want. Um, and yeah, I mean that's that's their thing right there. It's just does it improve conversation? Yes. And so what they really don't like is things that don't. So money, boring. They do not care for money. Um, they actually would rather donate it, and they do, than That's keep it. so funny. There is one other thing they do with money, though. And they do understand that money can help get other things. So, like, if you have money, you can maybe buy a nice painting or something. They're not going to steal because they're not evil. So if they do have money, they, will, they won't They will keep it in their lair because it isn't, it isn't useful for conversation. But what they'll do is they'll bury it somewhere and just leave it there. And what's kind of cool about that is you can make treasure maps Booyah. that literally you can find buried treasure of a brass dragons that would probably make him angry though maybe like, or maybe so he fun. would he just, made it he's like nice job he, he makes a scavenger hunt yeah. to go on with you guys yeah. <laughs> it's like so so what do you think's the next thing <laughs> that would be so fun. do you like my hint <laughs> <laughs> it's just like you just told us through this nah, uh-uh. <laughs> you gotta yeah that could be a fun like lighthearted adventure like you have to do the brass dragon scavenger hunt <laughs> for it to like if you like want something it's like ah, 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 you know you gotta like do something yeah. I, feel, I feel like that's what copper dragons do though they would do that but, but that's yeah. a other episode so anyway their treasure is a little unconventional it's all about conversation because that's really all they value is just being able to talk yeah um so in a lot of ways if you're in their lair there can actually be some really interesting conversations that are had mm. and they will totally be very good hosts they'll have wells and they'll have stores of food too oh yeah yeah so they can just create water that's one of the spells they get yeah they can just water booyah so water isn't really trouble food is though so um we'll get into some food things that they like but yeah so expect they'll feed you they'll make it not thirsty on a far desert travel so um, as long as you're talking I'll, as long as you're talking yes yeah, so yeah that's kind of like their and little... they'll try to keep you you'll be like man i've been here like five days we need to get going they're like what? but what about dessert you it's just I mean? like <laughs> all right buddy fine <laughs> um yeah okay yeah. but you mentioned water so there are a couple regional effects as they're called in the dungeon ma- or in the monster manual um that the la- their layers typically have and so one of them is in a six mile radius around their lair you as adventurers can find sand tracks that lead so tracks of them in the sand that lead to safe shelters uh hidden water so basically things that are like helpful in the desert and these tracks are intentionally placed the tracks will not lead to anywhere the dragon wants to keep untouched. Um, and so these tracks are actually kind of there for people to follow so they can get to anything they need. Um, so they're very nice in that sense. But there's some there's some cool uh, connections. So 
also that water. If a creature with a three or above intelligence comes within one mile of any of the water around their lair, uh, the dragon detects them and knows exactly where they are. It's kind of like radar. Yeah. Ding! Oh, we got someone. <laughs> exactly. It's like that or like a like a home security camera. You know, it's like just oh. like pulls out a remote. It, it, it's just sitting on his chair. Oh. Yeah, nice. and basically that helps them be like, oh, visitors, great, let's go uh, talk to them. Yeah. Um, and then the only, and then the last regional effect that they have, which is really cool and can be used in so many different ways, is there's illusions that haunt the land, and so this kind of gives me like a mirage vibe. But these are very powerful illusions, and they, there's a high DC to figure them out. But obviously, if you touch them or something, you figure them out because you go through them. But these are illusions that literally are just like walking around their layers. And so you might be like, oh, my God, like it's a whatever. And then it's an illusion. Or it might be like, oh, wow, look how beautiful that thing is. What is it doing in the desert? And then it's an illusion. So there's just these cool – you can really make it whatever you want. Typically, they'll be desert-themed. You see a terrasse coming straight for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my God. God. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. But that's an interesting effect there. It's definitely mirage-based, I think. Yeah. Um, okay. So the only thing left to do with their layers is they have layer actions. Uh oh. If yeah, if you ever decide to angry. attack them, you're not gonna really make them angry. But if you want to mess with them in their layer, they have a couple extra abilities. So they have two. The first one, um, and actually both of these are pretty non-lethal, as you can expect. But anyway, the first one is a strong wind, basically swirls around the dragon and it's a 60 foot radius so pretty large and if you're in that radius it has a dc 15 strength uh, save that you must make or you get pushed 15 feet away you get knocked prone any gases that are in the area are dispersed so get that poison gas out of here um flames that are not protected get immediately extinguished and I'm wondering if that affects magical flames. It does not say, so I think it might, I don't know, like a flame tongue, would that just get extinguished? Who knows? I mean, you could just turn back on. It's probably a rule somewhere. Yeah, but it would, yeah. Um, and then if they are protected flames, like a lantern, there's a 50% chance of those getting extinguished. So what you're dealing with here is like basically get away from me and turn off the lights. That's kind of what this is. It's a defense mechanism. Mm-hmm. Um. And they have dark vision, uh, tremor sense, or sorry, not tremor sense, blind sight, and you know, so they're fine without light. Is basically the point. Their second layer action is very similar, and it is a sand cloud that they can pick a point in space and make the sand swirl around that point. It's like a little mini sandstorm, and anyone in that swirl has to make a DC 15 Constitution save, or they get blinded for one minute. But on their turn, they can re-roll the save. That's a, so that's, that's a another shot. one. It's like, you're trying to hurt me, uh, throw sand in your eyes and run. You know what I mean? Cowards. Basically. The blue dragon just like, oh, God, coward. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so those are their two layer actions. And that's everything that has to do with their layers. Um, and they would use those layer actions in a pretty obvious way in terms of combat. Um which I am now ready to get into if you are. Ethan, for our podcast listeners, is currently drinking out of a drinking horn. It's a mead. Ugh. It's what? It's mead. It's mead? Yep. Or ale. Oh. Ugh. Yeah, so no, it's, it's a little water. horn with liquid inside of it. Oh. <laughs> Alrighty, so now let's do some combat strategies. So I'm just going to, well, what I will do you can add on I'm just gonna do give like the little basics of each age because they all act differently but the main goal the main i guess plot of their combat strategies is they do not want to kill you unless you are very evil basically so wormlings they will not even let you see them so there aren't really any combat with wormlings if you do detect them they will spray sleeping gas and fly away yeah, I mean, I, what I'm picturing with a combat of a wormling is, yeah. So in no way is the brass dragon in any level of their development gonna start this fight. Um, but if you attack them, I mean, I would assume you've already seen the wormling. So yes. how would the wormling? 
deal with you. So I guess if the wormling was so yeah, since they're brass, they would probably talk to you or like try to like you know be nice to you. But if someone just attacks it, it will do sleeping gas, run away, burrow away, yeah, burrow or even fly. As a wormling. Yeah, even as a wormling, it will just flee if it gets touched once. And if it's cornered and it can't uh, um, can't fly or get anywhere, it will shoot its lethal breath. But that is the last resort when it gets cornered. But that will never really happen because it can just burrow. Yeah, so it'll just go away. Well, okay. Here, let me give my breakdown because I think I have a few earlier steps than like any breath weapons or anything and then you add on what you think yeah um okay so the literal first thing that will be done um is they will avoid conflict as we're saying so so if we're we're talking about combat strategies but if there's any way out of it they will take it so then and like you said sleep breath flee is kind of how they're designed to to deal with combat that's the whole point um, but if they are forced to, to, to retaliate, um, they will they will not do sleep breath. They will start with their melee weapons, um, with their claws and their bite. And the reason is it's less damaging. These are kind of just kind of like a like a porcupine. It's kind of like like I can hurt you. Like you know, get away from me. I don't want to fight, but I can hurt you. So stop. Um, I kind of feel like it kind of fights like a cat. Kind of just a little. Yeah, like, like, yeah, get away from me. Like, I'm not trying to fight you, but get away. You know what I mean? Cats, like, house cats don't go out of their way to fight, typically. They normally only retaliate. Um, However, that's not always true. Um, But so they'll only use their breath weapon uh, if their attacker will will not be deterred. If the dragon is like, okay, these these creatures are evil, um, like, they're going to they're going to fight to the death here. um, So I'm going to need to actually fight them. Um, so that's when they're going to start using their breath weapon. Now, I should say, an adult is more likely to stick around and fight. Um, and, yeah. While the youngers will take the first chance they get to run. Uh, just because of just minorly pride, but also just a little more confidence in their ability to fight. Um, but they will especially stick around if they're in their lair. Because they're defending their home. You know what I mean? And they will not use their breath weapon their lethal one in their lair they will not use their fire breath it will destroy their stuff yeah their stuff is very flammable if it's books if it's if it's wooden furniture if it's paintings these are things that should not have should not be introduced to fire and they very much value those things so if you if you if you do fight them in their lair that's actually not a bad place to fight them because they will not use their fire breath They'll have their layer actions, but they will not and use a fire. I probably would get very angry if you fireballed all their stuff. They would get very angry. Um, however, if they're not an adult or higher, they will still run the first chance they get. Um, and even if they are an adult or higher, they will run when they're even moderately wounded. They will not let themselves like they're not they're not gonna f- they're not gonna be so prideful that they're willing to die over this fight. You know what I mean? If they get hurt, they're like, oh, dang, okay, this thing actually did kind of hurt me. I definitely need to get out now. Um, so there's that. Uh, so, yeah, do you have anything to add to that? Um, ancients? Uh, I, I do want to say, like, ancients are ancient. So they will probably fight everything unless it's bigger than themselves. But if they do see, like, a group of Avengers that are evil, they will instantly know, like, what's going on. So that's kind of like the what only. Mean, what do you mean? What's going on? The, the it it once it sees a group of adventurers, it will probably know pretty quickly if they're if they have bad intentions or not. So mm. they might surprise them. They might introduce themselves. You know, they might talk. All of a sudden, sleeping breath, hit them, and then they'll like do their multi attack and then run. They'll even um, and then they'll call upon their friends. That's kind of like a big thing. Mm. People, so. I don't know. I kind of don't think they would preemptively attack. If they know the group is evil. Okay, but so. how would they know? If if the parties just run uh, around, like, killing babies? Well, like, how the heck know. would they... Like, if someone's just walking through the desert, how do you know if they're evil? They're dra- I mean, I don't know. I mean, they're dragons. I just read this from, like, one of, like, the books. But, um, like, they're just... They talk to so many things. If they're ancient... 
So they've been around for such a long time. They are literal gods of, like, social... You're saying they have very high insight. Yeah. But they actually can have very bad insight. They can. That's if, what we were talking about in personality. Yeah, they can, but, like, if An ancient if one. any clues are given to the dragon, like, maybe, like, the person's, like, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I mean, all I'm saying is that for an ancient, they've been around for thou- almost a thou- thou- thousand to two thousand years they, they'll, they'll kind of know what's, you know, what's up. You know, maybe, like, they'll notice that the fighter might, like, draw its sword a bit. You know, kind of like physical body language. Yeah, but yeah. that could just be a defensiveness, not necessarily an evil. It could, but, like, ancients don't just, like, I don't really, heal over and, you I know, think they'll just you, spray and run. They'll protect whatever they're protecting, you know, from evil things. Lesser. But if it's yeah, but a, I think you would have to literally do something evil to make them see you as evil. I you guess can't so. Just walk in there, with but like that's a also very helmet. easy for them to do because outside they could just they could have been just a bird. Just, yes, they, you know, they so, could so, ambush you, so, but I don't think they ever would. They they would never ambush you. It's like if you interact with them, that's the only time they would. I don't they, think they, they ever would start gonna, with a sleep breath then run. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sure. But they're not going to sleep breath and then claw you. They're just going to leave. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They'll just leave. But if they, let's say they did want to kill you. Let's say, like, they had to kill you for some reason. Like, they were actually defending something or something like that. Um, I think, like, obviously they would they would use their fire breath as much as possible. So they'd line up their fire breath. they hit as many people as they can. Which is hard. Which is hard with their fire breath. Um, and But they would do that even if it means taking some opportunity attacks or whatever. They want to hit everyone with it because it does high damage. But what I think would be their really their big move would be sleep breath paired with picking you up and flying you extremely high into the sky and then letting you go, because that does not wake you up. As long as you don't take damage or someone doesn't use or someone doesn't use an action to wake you up, you're asleep. So I'm picturing they shoot the whole party with sleep breath, and if anyone drops, they're going to them asap and flying hundreds of feet in the air and letting go. And maybe the party could save them, but that's going to be a pretty much instant death. And I could see that as being the best thing to do. I Also, I don't know if this is used much, but can a creature grab someone and then burrow? Because if so, they could bury you alive. That would be messed up. Yeah. But they probably could. I think they could. And so that's the strategy I would take. They could stick you in their mouth and just... Yeah, I would definitely use the sleep breath. If I was a DM trying to kill the players with a brass dragon for sleep whatever reason. Sleep breath is broken. Sleep breath would be the way to go. It's not a super high DC, but once they drop, that you can die. You well, can it's an ancient. It's like 20. Uh, Right, if it's an ancient. Yeah. That's true. Even though um, as an adult, it's 18. Yeah, but then you're facing so level sure. 20 players, probably. Something like that. Uh-oh. So those are very strong. Yeah. They're going to beat a 20. I mean, lots of those players can get a DC 20 save. Yeah, and if they don't, someone will, and hopefully we'll be able to defend or something. Um, but yeah, it's I, I would definitely do kind of the loophole tactics for the brass giant because their hip because their damage isn't really there. It's not they don't deal a lot of damage because um, they're weak dragons. They're not made for damage. They're made for talking. So if you want to kill your players, use use the ability that they have to fly and burrow. That would be my that would be my tip. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. That's good, yeah. So, do you want to get on to fun facts? Yeah, let's do it. So, the first fun fact. They have a favorite food. A favorite food. A good gift for a, um, for a black, or not a black, for a brass dragon. It would be giant scorpions. They really? love to eat giant scorpions. Why? I assume they don't hunt them, though. They do. They do hunt them, but they can. But like I said, they don't want the desert environment to be out of order. So Remember, giant scorpions are not really normal, and they will kill everything in a desert environment. Yeah, but that's population control. Sometimes that's necessary. But, but generally, when they see one, they're like, "That's good, good." Food. I see. So they have a weakness. Good soup. They don't have like a sugar tooth. They have a scorpion tooth. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So they'll just eat a giant scorpion, which I think is sick. But nice. like, yep, I'd I just imagine they're like made, made like a soup just takes a good soup, you know, <laughs> just just like 
it would like yeah so that's yeah. a little gift or that's what they them. serve it's like little hors d'oeuvres yeah. yeah and it's like a little scorpion meat on a stick exactly with a little piece kebabs, of yeah little yeah. kebabs yeah so i'm um, pretty cool um i got one okay they have an innate ability to speak with animals yes it's not on their stat block but th- this this whole conversation company thing is also with animals so like if there's just a um who knows like a beetle a beetle they'll be like yo what's up and the beetle will be like well uh, uh, i can speak i can speak <laughs> but see that kind of makes me interested about the um the scorpion because they can talk to the scorpion so like, what do they say to the scorpion? Look, man, please don't eat me. It's yeah. like, I'm sorry, dude. You're just good. The scorpion's just like, anything. hey, I got an interesting story to tell you, and the brass dragon just stops stirring the the thing. It's like, well, okay, what is it? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Um. They will. Um. Well, I kind of guess we kind of said most of mine, so I'm sort of out. That happens sometimes. But um, they will um sometimes be like kind of like the power of like a kingdom so they'll be advisors to like um, oh, okay like they would be a advisor that makes a ton of form. sense because they not talk only, to literally everyone yeah they're so. constantly in like a room of conversation and they get to help and that's kind of stuff yeah so the only problem i would see with that because in that case like i would think a brass dragon would be like literally every environment or literally every political environment. But I could see the problem being that they like to talk. That doesn't mean they're always good at it. And remember, they're selfish about it. So I could see an advisor who just will not shut up. And it's, the king is like, will you stop? We're going to behead you. And then the guy, and then the advisor just laughs. <laughs> and then, you know what I mean? And then the king's like, excuse me? Yeah. And then the advisor's like... So I could see the power dynamic being a problem. Because dragons think they're the best and compared to just a meager king they are better like so it's yeah but i think they would eventually get fired yeah they probably would but like (laughs) every dragon is different so you might have one yes that's true that is a good advisor good diplomat absolutely good steward okay so uh one of mine is i would kind of want to throw out there that a dragon brass dragon will have a surplus of information and secrets about other creatures especially in the area but even far away creatures um and lots of networking if anyone needs those connections so they're a great place to go for just the news and like what's going on oh yeah um and a great way to kind of share secrets or something that would be a cool plot it's like you have to get to a brass dragon that was actually one of my extra ideas um Go to a brass dragon to, um, you know, get some information. But, like, yeah. he'll, he'll, he'll sit you down. It's like, so, tell me about yourself. And yeah. then it'll be annoying, and you have to sit there and, you know, that charisma stuff. I guess I'll add on, then, that they can also be great for info dumps. So if you want to share, like, history of something or local stuff going on that may be relevant for the plot. The lore master. Yeah, they're a great way to kind of shamelessly do it. Like, just sit there and tell your players what you want to tell them because that's what a brass dragon would do. They don't care if the players want to hear it or not. They are going to share the knowledge. And it can even be funny, you know what I mean? Like, you can be constantly interrupting the players. And the players are like, oh, my God, stop telling us your lore, basically. But it's the brass dragon doing it, you know what I mean? So that could be a good way to do that. Yeah, no, that would be great, yeah. Yeah. Um, That's kind of it for me. All right, no really with cheap. fun facts, I only have one more. So, um, I mean, we've already kind of said this, but just to highlight it, uh, it's very probable you'll encounter them, encounter them in humanoid form. That's kind of how they typically are, just because most sentient creatures that talk population, in terms of population, are humanoid. And so they'll be humanoid so they can talk to them and just be and just be more comfortable. Yeah. Right? Like, it's kind of intimidating to be talking to a giant dragon, so they'll be in humanoid form to kind of just make it comfortable and allow the words to come out you know a good interviewer yeah 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 that's good all right wait i just pictured have you ever seen the youtube show hot ones no i'm just I'm picturing i'm picturing it fitting really well with the brass dragon because i could see them having like a table right and on the table are 10 little scorpion chunks that have varying levels of spiciness to them and it's like an interview 
You know what I mean? And oh, so this God. The brass dragon brings on, like, local celebrities and, like, maybe, like, royalty. And they just ask questions. and While well, they eat the spicy spicy scorpion chunks. And then, like, the the one, like, big king guy, he, he like, tastes he's like... Although I think a brass dragon would be a terrible interviewer. Oh, God. Because they would just talk about themselves the whole time. Yeah. It's like, so, tell me about your family. It's like, the kid's like, well, I come from, like, well, actually, you see, my king, um... Speaking of family. I actually knew a lot of king... You know, it's just stuff like that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Extra ideas? Extra ideas. This is a funny one. Have a intelligent magic item. Have a distress call to <laughs> save it from the brass dragon. Oh, that is super funny. Have a magic. I was like, please help. This thing is ho- holding me hostage. You, you get like an ad in your dream where it's like a genie saying, yeah, double 50% off on wishes if you come and get me out of this brass dragon's lair. Good God. I'll give you double the wishes for half the price. Yeah. <laughs> yeah please. Please help me out, boy. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, or it's like a letter from like an old friend who's like trapped in a, <laughs> in a brass dragon's lair, and it says like they think I'm writing to you for like a to get information or something, but really, please come here. <laughs> I and get me out of here. <laughs> or I just imagine you're like a thief and you're looting a like brass dragon lair, and then mm-hmm. then you like walk up and then you see a sword like hey. Look, and you're like, what the heck? And you look down, it's like a little source, like, dude, just start, you need to get, so please pick me up, just steal me. For the love of God, I was here for hundreds of years. And it won't, oh. and it won't stop talking to me. Yeah, like, the, instead of you know. taking the treasure, the treasure start, tries to be a stowaway in your backpack. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's like, when he talk to a brass dragon, it's like, all right, I'll let you guys go. But, you know, and you leave it, it's like, and then you see a painting, it's like, dude. Come on, man. Like, please. I'll look great in your wall. Please take me, uh, t- t- yeah. take me with you. That'd be great. True. Okay. Um, this one I, I kind of used in our intro, but it's to kind of have a sandstorm as a reason to, to get the dragon to, quote, unquote, save them. And then keep them in his lair. Or Even lair. though probably he made it in the first place, but yeah. Well, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> Could be a little tactic. Um, okay, and then the last one I have is have just a raging party in a brass dragon's lair. That'd just be a crazy party where there's like sphinxes walking around, laughing, you know, like storm giants, angels, was, yeah, just yeah, like chilling genies. And then like the and adventures then you just have are the like, adventures like, oh my like, god, god. <laughs> it's just like, hey, yeah. what's up, buddy? Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I have one last one. This doesn't really fit frustrating really well but i did find it in one of the books have one rampaging um through this through the uh through the desert countryside because he's no missing sense. his um Busy sentient what? object someone stole it from his horde so have it when okay. he stole the sword he's like all right buddy where's the sword <laughs> and then the sword's like what are you talking about i ain't about? playing games they're, they're anymore more. and then the sword's like no man please no the problem is the brass dragon would probably also be a bad interrogator because he'd be like where's the sword it's no i really want it because i really like the blah blah, blah. and it's like all right let me tell you no uh, but no. you need to understand uh, no, that like, i really need, need to, to find it but yes but i have like a kingdom be like bro this bla- brass dragon he, he's been nice all, but now he's, like, just pranking everyone, burning down, not killing them, burning down people's houses and <laughs> He's stuff. putting everyone to sleep. sleep. I've been so unproductive. I've been <laughs> so unproductive. <laughs> and then, like, the guy with the, with the sentient sword's like, oh, well, we can't help with that. Uh, yep. Just gotta go. Let, let's go, guys. Let's just, you know, ignore all this. Yeah. But, yeah, so, pretty cool. So you can link, like, stealing the, the, the sentient object and... The brass it's dragon best coming friend. back to look at it. it's like that's my br- best friend and the object's like Mm-mm. and then it and then the twist is it turns out the sentient object is on the run. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it wasn't stolen. <laughs> yeah, it's just on the run. Yeah.